So I'm uh, Mark Davis. I'm the founder of uh, Moment Motor Company here in Austin, Texas, and uh, we convert classic cars into electric vehicles. Right. Right on. So. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what sure. you what you got right here? Sure. So I think if you think about the process, most people can get their heads around this. What we're really doing is we're replacing the internal combustion engine with an electric motor and uh, and putting a battery pack inside the car that allow the car to go right. you know where it needs to go. And so the first step of that is we've got to remove the internal combustion engine from the car, and then we can assess the space uh, uh, restrictions that we have and and uh, and how everything needs to fit in there. And then we also take the the original vehicle's performance. Uh, you know characteristics into account, and what the customers desired power and range um, uh, requirements are. So we take all of that together, and then we have kind of a, mo a modular motor and battery enclosure system okay. that allows us to choose the right package for that car and for that for that customer. So really, it's based around some kind of fundamental structures that we have here on display. So what we have are the notion of single motors and dual motors. Right. These motors are from a company called NetGain. Uh, it's called the Hyper 9. Uh, it's got about 175 foot-pounds of torque, 130, 140 horsepower. So it's a very capable motor for a small uh, uh, car. So if you have a, a Mini or a Bug or even a, you know, a Carmen Ghia or something like that, that size, smaller, usually import car is a great, this is a great option for it. Right. What we've done though is we've built a set of transmission adapters and motor mount um, uh, rails that allow us to take that same motor and put it in another car with just swapping out a few components, right? So, and we'll talk about that here. This is a good example of how we can then take one of those motors and pair it up with another motor and double the output that, that is required. So for a larger vehicle or a car with more performance requirements, right. you, can, you can essentially double what the power is in, in one of these by putting these together. But what you see here is the the structures that we have in place to make that easy is we have a very we have a common uh, mounting system here that allows us to swap out the um, uh, the transmission adapter for whichever car we're going into. So this is a BMW Getrag adapter. Over there is a Chevy small block adapter. In about. 30, you know, 15 minutes we can swap them out and we could put this motor in a different car. These rails, although you don't see it, but you can see it over here, are designed to fit a certain chassis mount system. So we can swap these out to make it, you know, mount into a, 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 the Cobra Ford Mustang uh, chassis over there, or we could swap them out to put it in that BMW over there. We really kind of designed this to be able to take our um, our architecture and put it into as many um, as many vehicles as possible. Wow! So that also so once we've kind of figured out where the motor and uh, uh, drive train essentially are going to go in the car, and we've mapped that all out. The next uh, challenge is where do you put the batteries, right? So I think in modern electric cars you realize most of the time the batteries are either in the floor or they're in some sort of central you know, tunnel structure and they're very integrated into the chassis of the, of the car. That's a very challenging thing to do with a 50 year old car. You can't really take out the floor of a car and replace it with a bunch of batteries. It's right. just not practical to do that. One would argue maybe impossible. <laughs> uh, so our goal then is to fit the batteries in, a, um, in parts of the car where you have space but also to try to not upset the balance of the vehicle as much as possible. These are these are small, typically uh, performance cars, and if you don't respect where the weight was originally in the car, you'll really upset the handling, possibly yeah. make the car very dangerous, right? So we want to put as much weight in the original uh, engine compartment as as it as it would have as possible, and then we would put the rest of the batteries somewhere else to try to maintain as much of the, the weight by balance in the vehicle. I, I consider that at all, that you have to uh, yeah. count for all the so, weight. So I'll give you an example, and you can see how we how we address that, which is in most of our conversions, we're using uh, Tesla Model S modules. So we have to get them out of recovered cars, sorry, reclaimed cars. So these are cars that have been in accidents, but the, the battery pack is still uh, uh, fully functioning. Right. And then the, the, the pack gets cracked and we take the modules out. But what we've done, instead of just jamming those modules into, uh, into you know, different spots, we've developed a modular battery box technology. And this is an example of uh, you know, what we would call a two box because there's two uh, Tesla modules in there stacked. Okay. 
Okay. But this um, but this box can be extended to be a three, a four, or a five, and that allows us to pull together and create a um, a battery pack that maybe lives in two or three parts of the car where it makes the most sense and there's enough space and and, and it doesn't upset the you know the balance of the car. Right. And it gives us that flexibility. So this architecture is very easy for us to assemble and do on a per per car basis and it all you know stays the same and has the same mounting uh hardware and mounting structure that we can put into these cars right um this one uh i think another aspect of this this is kind of interesting is that these boxes are not welded together we use uh, aircraft created adhesive and screws to keep it all nicely uh um uh you know assembled and rock solid right. uh and by not using welding we are able to keep this very dimensionally accurate. So once you weld, especially aluminum, there's a chance for things to shift around and move and oil can and do all sorts of stuff. The heat in aluminum usually does cause some stresses and stuff like that. This okay. basically allows this to be exactly as it was designed in CAD and perfectly dimensioned and then it lets all of our components kind of mesh together very nicely. Right. So um, if you want, you can see over here kind of how that all comes together. So this here is a 1970 BMW. Uh, 1602. Uh, it is a uh, originally a, a car that had about oh, I think they're 98, maybe 100 horsepower. Uh, and what we've done is we've put a, uh, a dual motor from a company called HP EVS in it, which would be a similar structure to that. It's just a little smaller, right? And then that's underneath. It's bolted up to the transmission, which is something we'll talk about in just a second, right? And then. Uh, you can see in the front here, there's a two module box, just like we were looking at there. And then in the trunk of this car, there's another, there's another four modules back here, right? Wow. And all of these are uh, this modular approach to the, you know, to, to putting the, the batteries and the, you know, the motor in the, in the car. This is the kind of thing that can be removed easily. Everything is self-contained. There's uh, integrated cooling. There's integrated um, uh, a battery management system inside all of this stuff. And then it's just, there's a, you know, twist on, you know, connector here that makes sure that everything is all, you know, so we can just disconnect, disconnect the uh, battery management system and pull this box and do out. if we needed to do maintenance or if we just needed, if we were gonna replace it with higher capacity batteries, whatever, that is all possible and easy to do from that standpoint. I can see a, the charging port. Yes, we just have the little charge. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of <laughs> the cheeky kind of thing that you could do is, you know, hey, it's right where the original gas tank was. Um, awesome. You know, on the Porsche, we actually hid it because it was something we were gonna do some body work on and it's just fun to, to play with the car a little bit. Now, we're really, this is, to me, about preserving these cars. And so we don't wanna, we really have a first do no harm approach to things. We really want to adapt all of this technology to the car without having to cut it up or make huge modifications to it. We're really trying to create a car that is as if one of these cars were designed to be in this, you know, in this world. You get to appreciate them for what they were, drive them like they were, uh, and uh, and really just take advantage of modern electric drivetrains. So, so one question I do have for you is yeah. like, I talked about this earlier, but sure. like most of these are probably people that are coming to you right. saying, I have this great old car I don't want to get rid of sure. and I want to convert to EV, correct? It is, it's it's actually sometimes that and sometimes that. So we do have people who come to us because they uh, have a passion for a particular car that they um, own. It's been in the family, right? So right. their, you know, their father had it or their mother had it or they saved up and bought one or what have you when they were a kid and they still have it. And yes, there's a lot of, um, you know, as you know, cars cause a lot of passion in people, yeah. <laughs> specifically myself as well. Uh, they And so they do come to us with that car and say, hey, I, I really want to get rid of the internal combustion engine and embrace this new technology and and uh, and drive this uh, this car more regularly. And right. part of that is that they understand what it takes to maintain a 50 year old internal combustion drivetrain and the hassle that that's involved. Right. The anxiety of driving around and wondering what that smell is and what that noise is and whether or not you're gonna be on the side of the road again, you know? Right. <laughs> and so this, after experiencing that for a long time, they go, I just, I don't, I don't wanna deal with that anymore. Right. And I, but I still love my car and I wanna drive it. So we do have that customer. We also have customers who have the reason it's the company's named Moment is because I believe if you're a car person, there's a moment when you become a car person, right? It ha might happen when you were six years old and your dad had a really cool car that he would take you out in on Sundays. It might have happened when you're 16 and you're just turning pages of a magazine and you see it and you're like, oh my, this is the car I desperately want to own and it goes on your locker door, whatever it is. Those 
moments are what I think make car people truly yeah. car people, car people, right? Yeah. And so sometimes those people they don't have the mechanical uh, capabilities or the um, or the, even the, the desire. They just love the car, and they never purchased the car because they were scared of what that might entail, the maintenance right. and the uh, and the mechanical knowledge they would need to have. And so they will come to us, like the owner of the Mini. Uh, the owner of the Porsche, you know, always wanted those classic cars in their in their garage to be able to drive, but they did not want to take on the responsibility and the difficulty that would be, inv you know, involved in, you know, maintaining that vehicle. So we're able to help them get their dream car and not only get their dream car, but get it in a form that they can drive every day, right? And this is, to me, this is the beauty of this, right, which is, if you own a classic car with an internal combustion engine, you come down to the garage and you're gonna go to the grocery store. And on one side is your Honda Pilot, <laughs> and on the other side is your 68 Porsche. Right. Getting in that 68 Porsche is a huge commitment. It's warming it up, making sure everything is working right. The the ticking noise that you heard the last time isn't present, or the fluid on the on the floor is not something to be worried about, or what have you. Right. And that usually prevents you from getting in that car. You usually go, eh, next time I'll get in the, you know, I'll get in the Honda now and just go run this errand. Right. These cars, once they're done, you just get in, you turn the key and go. There's no warming up, there's no nothing, you just drive it. And it's exhilarating. It's super <laughs> fun to have that immediately available to you, right? Right. The other thing that we talked about, that pr preservation of the driving experience, if you will, something that we try to do uh, I think this is something that's lost on, on, on a lot of people. Uh, we actually bolt the electric motors up to the original drivetrain, including the transmission. So you get to still drive this car the way it was originally intended to be driven. You get to shift the gears, row them, and have a blast, right? Like, yes, it's super fun. Yeah. And the nice thing is, though, you get all of the instant torque of an electric motor, but so that means that you can do that when you want to, right? So it's, they have plenty of torque and plenty of power to leave it in second or third gear and just putt around town without shifting, right? If you're in traffic and you don't want to be pushing in the clutch, you don't want to do that, you can just do that if you want to. Um, there's The motor doesn't idle, so you don't have any of that panic inducing, oh, I got to start the car on a hill at a stop sign. Is it going to, it's never going to stall. It's never going to leave you, you know, in that kind of situation. When you come up to a stop sign, you don't have to push in the clutch. You just stop. It's fine. You can leave it in whatever gear it's, you know, it needs to be. So you get to engage with it partially as the way it was, you know, as the way it was originally intended to be driven, but also you get to take advantage of the fact that it is a modern electric, you know, drivetrain and right. you can drive it similarly in the same way. You can dial up regen and you can make it, you know, you can even make these one foot driving, you know, cars. It's just right. a lot of different ways you can approach it. So I like that That's very aspect great. of it. Yeah. 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 What's the most unique or obscure car that you've converted? It's kind of funny. We're currently in, in the middle of uh, a conversion on a 1982 Toyota Hilux from Australia. So everybody in the United States remembers the Toyota pickups. Most most people remember, remember them from uh, Back to the Future, which Marty's you know yeah. <laughs> Marty's truck that he got in the end. Uh, this is a truck that was never sold in the U.S. It's and it's a four door pickup from the 80s, and it is. I've never seen people go more crazy for, uh, uh, it's so obscure and weird. There's probably five of them in the US and we had it in front of our shop and you would think we had a brand new Lamborghini out there. People would stop by every single day asking about that truck, whether or not it was for sale. Whether it was, so I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's, that's what we can do. And the owner of that truck grew up driving the two door version that we had in the United States, loved it, absolutely, you know, cherished that truck, but he has a family and he wants to be able to take, you know, his kids and whatever, to you know places in it and so he found it in australia and well actually he found it from somebody who imported it from uh, australia and now he has it it's a it was a dirty old you know diesel engine that he didn't want anything to do with yeah. and so now we're converting that into an electric uh, truck that he's going to be able to drive around in san francisco and and it's the kind of truck that everybody comes up to and asks him about it's going to be a really fun experience for him that's and now he gets to to do something that nobody else gets to do. yeah that's very cool um, one question i do have about like sure. In general, of these cars, like mm -hmm. you said, you can size to fit like yeah. the motors and the battery packs right. to adjust for range. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, like, like, what does that Porsche get for So that's a great question. Range? So people ask about this range yeah. question all the time. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, uh, yeah. Anyway, we could talk about that later <laughs> off camera. Um, so range is a tricky thing, right? Which yeah. is uh, a mile. We always say a mile is not a mile, right? You know, you can sit there and say, oh, 
how, you know, how many mile range? Well, at 85 miles an hour on the highway, <laughs> your car's not, you know, your your car's range is going to be a lot different a lot than more. if you're yeah. in a, you know, in a in an urban setting. So, um, I think I understand why range is important to people, and we want to be as responsive as we can be. At the same time, these are very old vehicles that don't have a lot of room in them, especially a car as swoopy and tiny <laughs> as a as a Porsche or that Mini over there. There's just a there's a finite amount of room for for batteries. One of the reasons that we choose the Tesla Model S batteries is they have the highest energy density of any battery in the market. So it allows us to save weight and space and get the most uh, the most energy out of each each of these packs. But usually these cars are in the 30-ish kilowatt hour uh, capacity, which is good for you know 80 to 100 miles, basically depending on how it's how it's driven. And Plenty to get around town. Exactly. So yeah. very around town. We do have the ability when the car has enough room to do it, and we're doing it in several of these cars, to get up to maybe around a 50 kilowatt hour pack, which would give you more like 150, 160 miles, which again, compared to a modern you know, Tesla or something like that, it's nowhere near that, yeah. but you gotta understand the constraints we're under and also the intended use of the car. Yeah. Uh, you know, we joke about the Mini, and it's like, it's got that range and that 80 to you know maybe 90 range, and it's like, if anybody spent that many miles in a Mini, they'd realize that's plenty of miles in a Mini. <laughs> <laughs> it's a who it's a fun to drive yeah. but it's also you know it's it's a it's a constraining vehicle it's it's not it's not a long road trip and kind of vehicle yeah. right? so it works great for the intended use as well. yeah so, i really appreciate it yeah thank you so much absolutely thanks yeah. for thanks for doing this